Good evening. A new night for Crime Watch Tuesdays. A new home here live in London's television centre and a new chance tonight throughout the United Kingdom to watch events unfold as viewers call in. We hope to help solve major crimes. You'll see tonight how a gang in Aberdeen got away with a fortune and then threw it all away. And in South London, brazen thieves who tried to steal security cameras but were caught on a TV system they were trying to filch. First, though, one of the most tragic events of the summer, a case unprecedented in British criminal history. You might have seen it highlighted again because of this program in the newspapers today. Yes, well, tonight a father and his lone surviving daughter help us appeal about the attack eight weeks ago in which someone bludgeoned his wife and his other child to death along with the family dog. Sean Russell is a university lecturer. He's a botanist. His wife, Lynn, was a geologist. And the girls were described as cheerful, bright and popular at school. The tragedy happened on a footpath coming home from school in one of the most rural and scenic parts of Kent. Lynn and her six-year-old daughter, Megan, died. Josie, who's nine, survived, though with serious head injuries. <laughs> Megan and Josephine had a very bright and happy future ahead of them. It had changed my priorities in life from pursuing work Megan, Josie, come and have to a putting my family first. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? Of it? Both of us, Lynn and I, were surprised that they were such lovely children. Uh, maybe we felt that we were a bit, um, being scientists, we were a bit precise and unemotional. But the children turned out to be very loving. So it goes like that. That's like right. That, then that, then that, then that. That's right, and there's a little tiny bug inside. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, let's go and look at the larkspur. Don't think you've seen those, have you? No. Why are you two busy friends? Hey, 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 well, I've had so many wonderful letters from people around the world saying how much they admired her, how strong a character what she was, how principled. She was very academically brilliant, but from the minute Josephine was born, she gave up her job and she became completely committed to bringing up the family. Hey, how was the swimming? Yeah, it was really good. I think won. Oh, excellent. Well done. You should done. have seen me, Mum. Oh, what about you? Oh, oh dear. dear. Never mind. Better luck next time. That Tuesday, Tuesday the 9th of July, Lynn picked up her children from the village school at Goodniston. They regularly walked home, a half an hour's jaunt across the country. About 20 minutes later, 20 past four, a driver suffering from hay fever remembers a woman, two girls and a dog joining the Aylsham to Staple Road. <laughs> this is Buckland Lane near Goodniston, some eight miles outside Canterbury. The date again, Tuesday the 9th of July. Were you around here at that time? Do you remember seeing the Russells or anyone else? The last steps taken by the Russells were along this track, used regularly by locals, known as Cherry Garden Lane. Look, when we get in, you two rush yeah. upstairs and get changed, and I'll get yeah. to it. <gasps> Flowers still mark the spot where the family was attacked. Lynn and Megan died, as did the dog. Josie was so badly injured that at first she was thought to be dead too. Since the murders two months ago, police have pieced together a great deal, but they now need new leads on three separate sightings. 
The first is back along the Ailsham to Staple Road. A woman came across a beige car pulling away from a junction that led to the murder scene. It was going really slowly. Oh, come on. So slow that I had to brake and change down gears. And then I was right behind him. Looking at. I noticed that he was looking at me from his wing mirror. Yes. He looked so agitated and really angry. And even when I turned to go around the corner, I noticed that he was still looking at me to check if I was going to follow him. About half a mile away, there's a local landmark outside Chillenden village. At about the same time, a woman was driving out of the village on Cave Lane and approaching the windmill when she saw a man standing by the road. She then saw him cross the road. His path may have taken him from the murder scene in these woods. He was heading roughly towards the rolling court area about half a mile away. That's where a farm worker saw a car. That's when I noticed a man standing at the end of his car, looking around, acting suspicious. He was up and down the bank, looking across the fields, all around him. Like the one seen earlier, the car was beige. He uh, started to jog down the road towards my direction, so I looked away because I didn't want to see him staring at me. Like. When I looked back up, he was running back towards his car. It's just the way the man was acting, really, like, suspicious. I knew he'd been up to say, I've riding something. Just didn't know at the time. I took the dog round for a walk, about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes after. Walking up, and I was looking where, where he was parked, where he was standing. And then the dog pulled in towards the edge. And I noticed a bag being stuffed in the bushes. The bag contained blood-stained strips of towel, and the blood was from the Russells. In every sense, the family has been destroyed. I can never have that again. Not as... as full and complete a family life. I don't believe I'll ever find that again. It's like one, hopefully, half of my life has come to an end and I start a new half from a much more impoverished point. The gold I have left is Josephine. Mid to late July. I just have to look at her to see the way she's um, got better so quickly. That's what gives me strength to carry on. But I cannot make head nor tail of why a woman and two children and a dog would be attacked in that manner in the open countryside. Why? I think that's a word on everyone's lips. Uh, Detective Chief Inspector Dave Stevens, these are despicable murders. The intention was to slaughter almost an entire family. Yes, it was. It's very hard to find words to describe the horror and brutality of this despicable crime. Lynn Russell was bludgeoned over 20 times, probably with a hammer. Any one of those blows would have caused her death. Young Megan, an equal number of blows, each of which could have caused her death. Josephine witnessed that. She witnessed her mother and her sister being killed. They even killed her pet dog. And she will be able to provide some crucial information, you hope? Well, I've got to say, and what is good news about this is Josephine has made a remarkable recovery, and I do believe in the very near future she'll be speaking to us. Now, you have those three important leads to follow up, all within about half an hour of the murder. Crucially, the one of the, the chap acting very strangely beside the parked car... Yes, he was acting strangely and for a, some considerable length of time, about ten minutes. The thing that's so crucial about that is that we found the towel in which contains the blood of our victims. Now, another beige or light-coloured car was uh, seen about 15 minutes earlier and the driver behind that car was able to give you a very good description of the driver. A very good description indeed. Um, 
he was described as in his 20s or 30s, fair complexion, ruddy. Um, he, perhaps the most noticeable feature about him was his hair. It was light in colour, perhaps even ginger, with a noticeable fringe, and he was wearing a red T-shirt. Do you think the car was the same in both situations? I think there's every chance it was. It wasn't very far away, and it was described very similarly. So what did the car look like, actually? The car was um, light in colour, medium-sized, uh, perhaps an escort-type vehicle. I think one of the most uh, prevalent features about it was an anti-static strip, which is basically a piece of rubber that uh, comes down from the back bumper onto the road to, to avoid travel sickness. I think it might have had a GB sticker, probably quite old, maybe a B-registered uh, uh, car, headrests with oblong holes. Now, the other sighting, near Chillenden Village, a different description of a man, but possibly involved as well. Aye, it was a different description. Um, this could be a vital witness. It al also could suggest maybe there were two offenders. Now, I know you've made appeals over the weeks for several witnesses to come forward, more information, but at the end of the day today, you want to make a very personal appeal, don't you? I do indeed. Um, I would appeal to anybody who may be a family member, may be a close friend of the person responsible for this, when this happened, I think blood would have appeared on clothing. I think maybe the offender could be injured. But I think psychologically, this person must be damaged in some way. And my appeal tonight is anybody who's got the slightest idea at all, please, please come forward. Pick the phone up tonight and call us. Dave, thank you very much. Well, we all here can only echo that. Please call if you can help, if you have any information. 0500 600 600. It's a free call number here, live to the studio. 0500 600 600. Or the incident room in Kent, which has been set up especially for Crime Watch calls. That's 01622 654 321. That's easy to remember. Maidstone 654 321. Each call can make a difference. Since our last programme, 12 people have been arrested or convicted for serious offences, some with help from viewers, five as a direct result of calls to Crime Watch. Charges include three separate murders, deception, robbery and intent to rape. One man was arrested in a park in East London the day after the programme. He'd been recognised by a viewer there. The man has now been charged with the murder of a woman who was almost 90. A man wanted in connection with the fatal shooting in Manchester has now been charged with murder too. You may recall there'd been a series of sex attacks last year on a beach in Aberdeen. The offender saw himself portrayed in a crime watch reconstruction and gave himself up at Grampian Police Headquarters the following day. He's been sentenced to eight years. Viewers call suggested two names for a frightening robbery in Clwyd in North Wales and one of those people has now been charged. By chance, the other man, though unconnected with the robbery, was found to be in possession of a large amount of what police say is stolen property. So he's been charged too, though, with a separate crime. Arrests not as a result of crime watch, including that of Victor Farrant. He's now awaiting extradition in connection with murder and attempted murder. And four men have been charged after our reconstruction of a post office robbery in Lincolnshire. Again, though, this wasn't as a direct result of calls. Finally, this picture shown at the end of the last programme. Well, that was spotted by a viewer in Birmingham and recovered just before Christie's in London. Would you to auction it? Well, let's hope tonight is as successful. Here now is Superintendent David Hatcher with a face you may recognise. Yes, in fact, it's a picture of a woman wanted for deception. Here she is at a bank in Huddersfield where she's come to open an account. And do look at her carefully if you work in a bank or in a shop because she's out to con you. She uses stolen and forged documents to open new accounts, obtains lots of checkbooks and then goes on a spending spree. She's been seen from Yorkshire through the Midlands and down to Dover on the south coast. But who is she? If you can help, please call 0500 600 600 or call the local police on 01484 436 702. That's in Huddersfield, 436 702. Well, out of that robbery in Aberdeen, £20,000 taken by an armed gang, and it all went up in smoke. It took place in Cults, a fairly close community where almost everyone, it seems, saw something, and several tried to intervene. Cult is a small suburb of Aberdeen, approximately eight miles from the city centre on the main North D side road which leads out of the city. The junction of North D side road and St Devnick's Place is always very busy with commuter traffic in the late afternoon. 
Well, sitting at the lights, I was aware of this man just beside the bank, a man of 25 to 30 years of age, five feet, nine, ten, slim build, pale complexion, very gaunt features, dark haired, wearing a combat jacket and a baseball cap. When I became aware of this second man, he moved slightly forward and spoke to the man across the road in a sort of Dayside Fife accent. This man was a bit older than the first man, again six feet tall, very broad, very short fair hair with a fringe and a slight stubble. Hello, that's your BT engineer here. Hi, <laughs> that's right, just to let you know that your new line's just now been installed and it's up and running. I was working in the exchange that afternoon on South Avenue and at around about quarter past four left exchange to walk along South Avenue towards the bank. This brown Sierra car came round the corner and parked. And these guys got out. I thought, strange place to park a car. These men had camouflage gear on and something tucked under their arm. Immediately became suspicious. I went into the bank to collect some holiday euro checks. I heard somebody shouting and turned round and saw these three men virtually bursting in through the door. And I was very aware of this one person, well, with a gun, who stayed with us, with the customers. Uh, I think we just felt totally helpless. The, you didn't want to sort of move or do anything at all. I, I still just couldn't believe that this was actually happening. When I looked round at the girls at the other side of the counter, you realise just from the, the deadpan look in their face that this was for real. It was strange. We were inside the bank, all this was happening, and you wondered if anybody outside was aware of the situation because life was going on out there. Anybody could have walked in. Hello, police. I think there's going to be a robbery. Mm -hmm. I'm on St Devonick's place at the bank on the corner. Three men have just walked in and they've got a gun. Hurry up, please. Oh, they're coming out. They're coming out now. They've just walked past me. Hi, that's right. It's, it's a kind of a, a ready coloured Sierra estate. And, and it's part in South Avenue. Yes, yes, I do. It's uh, B990 XES. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's coming up South Avenue towards me now. They've just thrown something out of the car and it's smoking. I, no, yes, they've turned it up Dunmail Avenue. That's right. This woman then saw the gang turn into Colts Avenue, heading north and out of town. Police still need more witnesses. Do you recall seeing anything unusual? Sierra Estate, last seen in Dunmail Avenue, heading north out of Colts. About half past four, I was travelling to work up Kirkbray, heading towards Dice Police Station. I came in behind two cars, both Ford Sierras. The one immediately in front of me was an ocean blue sea registered saloon. The one in front of that was a maroon estate car. The cars were traveling slow for the type of road. I thought initially that they were traveling together. They were either lost or looking for somewhere to stop. I wasn't on duty and didn't have a police radio with me. So I was unaware that a bank robbery had happened. The two cars turned into the Forrester Commission car park at Counties Wells. Graham, the car's over here. Okay. This red car had been reported stolen from Dundee. But whose was the blue Sierra? The registration number is Bravo 990 X-ray Echo Sierra. Over. Eric Leslie, for a reason we don't need to go into, but from today that uh, blue, ocean blue Sierra is obtaining even greater significance, and, and you don't think it was stolen? 
No, we, an audition, our additional inquiries suggested it wasn't stolen. And I'm confident that, that car is possibly owned by the robbers or was loaned to them to commit the crime. So we've got descriptions of people and we've got descriptions of the car if they can be linked. That's, that's likely to take people towards what could be a £15,000 reward in this case. D just take us through the description of the men again, will you? Yeah, the first man is 25 to 30 years, 5 foot 9. He's described as being skinny. He's got uh, dark collar length here and has gaunt features. He was joined by a second man who's in his early 30s, about 6 foot tall with a bigger build, with short fair hair, with a fringe right across his brow, and he spoke with a Dundee accent, which is also significant in relation to the car being stolen in Dundee. And the third man, though this might of course be the same description of one of the others, you're not, not sure on that point. The third man was seen driving the car away in North Deeside Road after the robbery. He is described as a mid-twenties, round-faced, and described as good-looking. OK, now... The cap that one of them was, was wearing, we've got it here, it says Troop on the front of it, it was dropped in the bank. You're not interested in finding out where the cap came from, you know no. all that, you just want to know who dropped it? Correct. Now there was another cap too, which is caught on the security cameras, I think it says Paris on it, is that right? Yes, it's in multicoloured lettering and it's significant, I want somebody to put a name to those caps and the car. OK, we don't want it to just vague details about the caps please, whether they were manufactured or anything. Now this is some of the money that was recovered and this shows the dangers now of trying to rob a bank because it's basically got a smoke bomb uh, contained in, in the money and the people who did this robbery would have been utterly contaminated with this which is why I'm keeping it in this polythene, it would still contaminate me. How difficult would it be to wash off if I touched this money? It would take some time to wash off, it is possible, but the clothing would be well contaminated and that would be difficult to uh, destroy. So, as I say, lots of clues. If you can put them together again, there is a substantial reward, £15,000. There's the number, 0500 600 600. There may be a Dundee connection or a d connection further south than Aberdeen. The number is free here to the studio, or you can call the police. The contact line direct to Aberdeen is 01224 626 060. That's Aberdeen, 626 060. Now, here is Detective Constable Jackie Holmes. And I hope you'll be able to recognise the two men here, both sought in connection with serious drug offences. First, Anthony Clifford, who's 56 and comes from South London. He's disappeared, but we're keen to talk to him about a huge stash of drugs that was smuggled into Britain last year. The haul was discovered by the South East Regional Crime Squad, so do tell us if you've seen him. 0500 600 600 or call them direct on 01 442 241 199. That's Hemel Hempstead 241 199. And then there's this man who's a New Zealander. He escaped from a maximum security prison there in 1993, and he may now be living here on false documents. His real name is Brian Curtis. He has contacts in Essex, Birmingham and Ireland. So do give us a call. Or call the extradition squad on 0171 230 3191. That's 0171 230 3191. Well, just uh, to let you know of some of the calls that we've had so far on the Russell murders in Kent, we've had several calls giving names. Two calls have actually mentioned the same name. We've had one person who's been so moved by the case that they've actually put up a £10,000 reward and uh, also suggested that the car that was used in the crime may have actually been a Volvo. Few people have suggested that and a name has been suggested for the Aberdeen armed robbery as well. Now, some years back, Crime Watch gave one of the first glimpses of a new aid to detection, and it directly helped to solve a murder. A medical artist, Richard Neve, developed a sophisticated way of reconstructing human faces from skeletal remains. Well, his services have been called upon many times, and this summer, Hampshire police got in touch with him after a body was found in a shallow grave on a farm near Southampton. Now, this is the face that Mr. Neve has reconstructed. It is, of course, just a likeness, but the man we think was probably Asian. He was about 40 years old. He was short. He was about five feet four inches tall. He had very small feet, size five and a half, and he wasn't circumcised. Now, his face is a little lopsided. He wore an earring in his left ear. The only item of clothing he had on was this fake Pringle sweatshirt. You can see here it's Nick Faldo collection. Pringle don't actually make one like this, so it is fake. And the grave contained a chunny, which is rather like a sarong. His body was found in this sleeping bag. Now, we know that it was made by Millets and it was on sale since March 1995. So did you by any chance sell it to a man looking like this? 
But uh, DCI Mike Lane from Hampshire Police is here to tell us more. Mike, first of all, what can you tell us about the chunni that was found? We don't actually know whether it belonged to the victim or not, but it's an Asian garment, typically worn by Asian women, um, either as a headscarf or a, a sash. It can also be worn by Asian men around the waist. Now, the body was found at Little Abshot Farm near Southampton on the 7th of June. Do you believe that he was killed around that time? The forensic scientists have told us that they believe he was killed sometime in May of this year. So some weeks previously? Yes. What was the significance of the farm? Do you think he worked there? Well, the farm employs a large number of Asian workers, and we're particularly interested in the period from July 1995. We've spoken to a large number of workers from the farm, but none of them so far say they recognise the face. We're anxious particularly to interview workers who we know were brought in from Southall in London on a daily basis on buses, and uh, we'd very much like them to contact us. Now, they may have been reluctant to call you for various reasons, but you do stress that their calls will be treated in the strictest confidence. Yes, of course, and we don't know whether the victim was a worker or not on the phone. Now, another lead you have is that the victim had some specific dental work on one of his teeth. Yes, he did. He had a three-quarter crown, which was made from a gold alloy, and that was in the lower left jaw at position number six, and we're very keen to talk to any dentist that may be able to connect the face with the, this work. Dave, thank you very much indeed. Well, if you recognise this face, if you think you've worked with him or if you can help in any other way, then do please call 0500 600 600. There is a reward, by the way. Or you can call the local police on 01703 456 902. That's Southampton 456 902. Now here again is Superintendent David Hatcher. Now a guy who tried on a complicated fraud, or at least I've got his picture. But who is he? He's in his 30s, short, with thinning brown hair and a South of England accent. A bank in the City of London received an order to transfer money to a jeweller's. Bank staff spotted the document was forged and police went to the jewellers to find out what was going on. Just as they were there, a man phoned to ask for a large supply of Krugerrands, South African gold coins. Well, a surveillance operation was set up and that afternoon a chauffeur arrived to pick up the gold. He said he'd been employed by a man calling himself David Mortimer, whom he'd seen the previous night at a hotel in central London. And that's where this comes in, the so-called David Mortimer checking into that hotel. Do you know who he is? 0500 600 600 to call us here in the studio or call the fraud squad on 0171 601 2598. That's 0171 601 2598. And do you know who this man is? He's opened up at least two accounts in two different name building societies using different names and has paid in cheques that don't belong to him. Police soon got onto the ruse and were actually on the phone to this branch when the man tried to obtain cash from one of his accounts. But he panicked and just before the officers arrived, he left. Do tell us who and where he is on 0500 600 600 or you can call the local police direct on 0171 380 1411. Sorry, double O. That's 0171 380 1400. Now to Preston in Lancashire and the murder of a university student, Janet Murgatroyd. It's almost three months. Saturday, the 15th of June. That was a memorable day, though. The big bomb in Manchester went off that morning, and England played Scotland in the European Championship that afternoon. But for Janet, it was a day for celebration. She just finished her exams, and it was one of the warmest weekends of the year. There was a body, that of a young woman. It had been in the water only about half an hour. Janet was 20, a local girl who went to the local university. She was studying law and had just completed her first year. 
She'd planned to go into Manchester that day to shop for clothes, but changed her mind. Then, hearing of the Arndale Centre bomb, she was thankful that she'd cancelled. That afternoon, Janet met up with a friend from university. Oh, I didn't tell you. I bought a Greek phrase book. I'll lend it you if you like. Yeah, right. During the holidays, the two planned to go Not backpacking really. through really Europe. Because it says you've got to learn the alphabet first. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. So I'd never travelled around Europe before, and Janet hadn't, so it was going to be a new experience for both of us that we were going to share together. We couldn't have been happier. We were both on top of the world that day. We really were. We thought nothing was going to stop us from here on in. That was it. We were free to do whatever we wanted for those ten weeks. And we were going to make sure we were going to do them as well. So what, spend a month there? What, in Greece? No, no, I think we should leave a bit earlier, spend more time in Italy. I think I'm going to like the Italians. But aren't they supposed to pinch your bum all the time? Maybe we'll get an Italian phrase, but I don't know. <laughs> We were very happy. We'd, we'd been in the pub quite a lot of the afternoon. And it was going to be our last night out before we went on our holidays. We were making it a good night. It's really crowded out here. What about there? Excuse me, are these seats taken? It was towards the end of the night and we had had a lot to drink by that stage. So we decided to stay in the Adelphi for last orders. Somehow we got we got separated and we ended up make, parting company and going our own way home. And that was the last time I ever saw Janet. And and I remember thinking to myself that I should wait for her and make sure that she got in a taxi safely, or to make sure that she came back to my flat with me. But it it just didn't happen and. And the worst of it is I can't even remember the last thing that I said to her or the last thing that she said to me. Janet really had had quite a lot to drink and maybe found it hard to get a taxi. At any rate, shortly before 1am, she was heading towards Penwortham Bridge. Security cameras tracked her as she weaved her way down Fishergate. I remember that night because I was late picking my mother up from her sisters. Look at that girl, walking by herself at this hour. Shall we give her a lift? Yeah, uh, she'll be all right. Stop. Mother wanted me to stop, give the girl a lift. Yeah, she looks drunk. She's so I just said to my mother, there's no way I'm going to give her a lift. She could be sick in the car. And we just carried on our way home. Did you see Janet waiting at the start of Penwortham Bridge? And did you see anyone else in the vicinity? shouting at somebody, could have been anybody on the path, anything. You get it a lot down here, people coming from town, clubs and everything. So I never thought nothing more about it, I just went to back to bed. A cab driver saw two significant events around this time. I remember as I approached the bridge, I saw a couple in front of the Volvo garage, they were arguing. She was told than he was. And as I turned onto the bridge, I saw a man running across the front of me. And then I saw a girl in front of him, it looked like he was chasing her. Perhaps I should have stopped. About 15 minutes later, half past one or so, these two brothers were coming across Penwortham Bridge. We'd been out into Preston at Tokyo Joe's nightclub, and because it was a nice warm night, we decided to walk home. 
when we reached the far side of the bridge, I heard a noise, that of a girl. It was a, a moaning, groaning sound. Mm. I've, well, I've worked in a dental surgery and it reminded me of the noise somebody makes when they're coming out of an anaesthetic, like they're incapable of talking. It is um, a funny area and we have seen stranger things before and nothing has come of that. So we just carried on where we didn't think twice about it. Janet probably lay unconscious on the riverbank until the tide rose on Sunday morning, picked her up and carried her upstream. She had massive head injuries, but died finally of drowning. Her clothes were found beside Penwortham Bridge. I can only hope that Janet didn't suffer. I, I can only feel hatred towards the person that's killed her absolute total hatred and also disgust at whomever is shielding him and uh, and I hope that they don't sleep at nights really because I find it difficult to sleep at nights um, I, I wake up sometimes at two and three in the morning thinking well I'll just check that Janet's home and then and then I burst into tears because I know she's never going to come home. Um, and that's foul. And someone knows. Someone is shielding Janet's killer. I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, so I just hope that this helps, really. Three months after the murder, this morning, at the parish church near her home in Penwortham, Janet was finally buried. Graham Gooch, you think her attacker was likely a local man. How would local people recognise him? How would they know him? Well, th this is a man who has committed a very serious offence. It will play on his mind. He will have, his behaviour may have probably changed just after the event, and he will still be thinking about it. He will still want to tell somebody about it, and may have told somebody about it. Given the extraordinary level of violence, it seems most unlikely he wouldn't have done something approaching this before. I mean, is this going to be a man with a criminal record, with a violent past? Well, certainly, I'm convinced that he has attacked women before. He may not have had um, a criminal record because the women may not have reported, but this is a man who's used violence on women before, and I believe if he's not caught, he will do it again. You think that? Yes. Piecing together the physical descriptions you've got of him, how do you describe him? Well, the man we're looking for is about five foot ten to six foot tall. He's a white or pale-skinned Asian man. We know he's got black hair. He was wearing a long-sleeved white shirt and very dark, probably black trousers. Now, there are several people you need to eliminate. First of all, the two people arguing at the Volvo garage, but others who were seen on security cameras in the area. First, two men who were walking down Fishergate Hill just before Janet. Describe the importance of them. Will you? Well, we're particularly anxious to speak to the man we can see on the right in the white shirt with the dark trousers and the dark hair. Um, we really need to find out who he is uh, to eliminate him from the inquiry because he was going just ahead of Janet. It says the 16th of June. Actually, it's late on the night of uh, Saturday the 15th, early in the morning of Sunday the 16th of June, about 1 a.m. Then there was a man walking up Strand Road. To, roughly, th those two roads meet, of course, just before Pinworth and Bridge. Yes, this man was walking towards the scene of the murder at about the right time, so he will have arrived on the, at the bridge about the same time as Janet. We can see him walking towards the bridge and later a better picture of him coming back. Now, he was there at the right time. We really do need to speak to him. There's not much going on around that area at the time, so who was he? If you can help in any way, do please call 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. Even if you've just suspicions, you can try the instant room at Preston. That's on 01772 410828. That's Preston in Lancashire, 410828. And now, here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames again. Last December, through a lucky break, police in Lancaster came across a lorry loaded with stolen antiques. Detectives soon arrested two men in connection with the thefts. But they also found fingerprints on the furniture belonging to this man. His real name is Sean Astwood. He's 27, quite tall, and has used several different names. He travels across Lancashire, Cumbria and North Yorkshire, but where is Mr Astwood now? 0500 600 600 or call officers direct on 01524 633 33. That's Lancaster 633 33.
And who is this man? At the end of July, there was a violent robbery at a Tesco store in Sheffield. Several armed men attacked the duty manager and tied up all the staff. Although they're wearing masks, you might still have some idea who they might be. This is a call received some 20 minutes later. It might be one of them. Uh, yes, mate. I mean, I'm going to say this once, and it's not an hoax. Go to Ecclesaw Road, Tesco. All the staff are tied up in the cigarette room upstairs. The side door, fire exit door is open. There's a very big reward on this one, so do call if you can help. Or you can call local officers on 0114 296 4951. That's Sheffield 296 4951. We're getting inundated with calls on the Russell murders. Lots of names. The same name has been put forward four times now. Another name has been mentioned twice. And the Aberdeen armed robbery next girlfriend says she recognises one of the EFITs and thinks he had a similar car. Lots of other names are coming forward on that as well. Now, finally tonight, the robbers who tried to steal equipment that had been put in to stop thieves stealing things. For four weeks, closed-circuit television had been installed at a school at Dulwich in South London. Now, you might have thought that that would be a good deterrent, but there's no accounting for human nature. On the first night of operation of the equipment, two young men tried to steal the cameras, and to some extent they succeeded. But they didn't steal the control centre, which recorded all their movements. So here they are in all their glory. For several hours, they were recorded as they went to each camera in turn. Who are they? A lot of people must recognise this body language, these faces. Do please call. And incidentally, the cameras they stole have distinctive serial numbers, and there's a list on CFAX on page 614. So if you've been offered or are offered security cameras, make sure you're not buying stolen property. 0500 600 600, or local officers can be reached on 0171 232 7152. That's 0171 232 7152. Five, two. And that's it for this month. Our lines are open until 12.15. That's 0500 600 600 for any of our cases. Now, we have been busy tonight, as you've seen, but if you have any information, please keep trying. I promise you will get through eventually. And if you know something on any crime that we haven't covered, then call Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 555 one. We'll be back a month from now. Remember, we're on Tuesdays now. But the next date's an easy one to remember, Tuesday, October the 1st. Do join us then. In the meantime, watch out in two weeks' time for Crime Watch File. That's an update on how a major inquiry was solved by Crime Watch viewers, and that's on Tuesday the 17th. But don't forget, we'll be back tonight with Crime Watch Update, news of what's developing now as police respond to viewers' calls. I've just heard some more information, which I haven't got time for now, but Crime Watch Update at 5 past midnight. If you can't stay up till then, well, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Ross and Jill Dando. Welcome back to what's been quite a dramatic evening. 255 calls so far and rising on the Russell murders. One man has been named at least a dozen times. Another name has also come up repeatedly. There's frankly so much information on that case that the detectives have so far only had a chance to go through a fraction of it. Very good information too on the Aberdeen armed robbery that ended in fiasco. A team of three has been named and one call in particular has been described by the detective as very, very positive indeed. On the Janet Murgatroyd murder, less definitive but there's still lots to go through. 
Well, first, more details on that terrible attack in Kent in which a mother, her children and their dog were attacked as they walked home from school. <laughs> Lynn Russell and her youngest daughter, Megan, died. Josie, who's nine, was left for dead. Even Lucy, the family dog, was killed. Now, a farm worker noticed a stranger with a car and was suspicious. Well, DCI Dave Stevens, I mean, 255 calls, about a dozen, I think, giving the same name. You, are you encouraged by all this? I'm very encouraged by the, all of the calls that have been received. Uh, I've uh, looked through many of them and uh, very, very interesting. Certainly the person that's been identified 12 times is extremely interesting and my officers already are, are looking at that. Now, you've had a few calls about the sightings of a possible car involved, but let's have a few more details about the car. Yeah, the car is very significant. Um, the car... First of all, a beige car was seen in Rolling Court. Uh, we haven't had too many calls on that so far, and, and, and a few more would be nice. But the beige car that was seen by the witness, perhaps I could just repeat some of the salient features of it. I think perhaps uh, the most identifi identifiable feature about it was th this rubber strip that came from the, uh, the bumper down to the, to the road. Um, it was possibly an Escort or that type shape, beige in colour, fairly old, possibly a B-registered car. And you also need uh, a bit of information as well from people who may have seen the Russells on that last, last walk. Yes, again, we've yeah. had one or two people who were in the area on yes. the 9th, but nobody's actually uh, come forward yeah. saying they've seen uh, right. Lynn and the family. Well, the lines will be closing in a few minutes, but we will give you other numbers you can try in just a moment. And now to Detective Constable Jackie Hames and some of the faces viewers have been calling in about. Firstly, Anthony Clifford, possibly involved in drug dealing. About seven viewers have called in with sightings, but the Hemel Hempstead police really do need to know where he is now. Call us if you know. Then there was Brian Curtis, the prison escapee from New Zealand. Only three calls, which may suggest he's out of the country, but he's almost certainly using false docs, so concentrate on that face. If you've seen him, call us. And lastly, Sean Astwood, his fingerprints were found on some stolen antiques. Among the dozen calls received so far, recently, uh, recent sightings in the north of England and suggestions for vehicles he may be driving will keep the local Lancaster police happy. Well, now the bank robbery at Colts in Aberdeen. An armed gang terrorised staff and customers, but bystanders called in the police, uh, and in any case, new security measures meant that the cash they stole went up in smoke. Eric Leslie, you've been delighted, I know, by, by the calls, and you've got to be discreet about one in particular, but I think I'm right in saying it's linked with the £15,000 reward. Yes, and it's giving us a very positive line of inquiry. Now, what about the others? I, I've seen names come in in abundance, but some of them have, have seemed to link together. People have been suggesting this three and these two work together, people like that. A number of calls have actually given us three names for the EFITs together as a group or a gang. And these, again, will be followed up, and I'm very happy with the response. You were hoping for some links to a C-registered blue Ford, which was seen at the Ford Sierra, which was seen at the time of, of the robbery. Has anything come in on that? There have been one or two calls, but I'm still interested in any ocean blue, blue Sierras, uh, particularly if they link to any of the EFITs, anyone that looks like the EFITs. Is it too early to say you think you're going to crack this now? I'm positive that we will. All right, thanks very much indeed. If there's more that you can add, and remember, there is a big reward, £15,000. We'll have phone numbers in just a moment. Well, we were hoping tonight to identify a murder victim. Now, a body unearthed by a tractor ploughing in a field in Hampshire. This is a plaster model constructed from the skull and other clues. He was a male, probably Asian. He was short, about five feet four, and aged around about 40. We hoped that dentists might remember fitting him with a crown, or farm workers may recall him at Little Abshot Farm outside Southampton. Well, DCI Mike Lane, what news so far? We've had a good response, about 50 calls, um, one or two interesting ones. For example, a store detective in Sussex tells us that she believes she recognised the face, hasn't seen him around since about the time of the death, which is very mm. interesting. Let's dwell a little bit on the crown that was fitted. I mean, to us, it's just figures, but uh, dental technicians might actually recognise the, uh, the the composition of the filling of the crown. Yes, they might, and we're disappointed that we've not heard from any. It's a specific mix of alloys, uh, of metals to make the alloy. We know that only one company in the UK produces that, although it could be produced elsewhere in the world, and they have sold in turn to 179 dental technicians. So we are hopeful that a dental technician would recognise the order for a lower left jaw tooth in position number six 
three quarter crown with this alloy mix. Well, let's hope someone does recognise that. And also, I think he had a, a rather large overbite as well, where the front teeth yeah. overlap the bottom. That's right. Now, if you have anything to add, call the incident room direct at Hampshire. Now, news from Superintendent David Hatcher. First, that city fraudster. Well, we had eight calls altogether. One in particular gives a name which links to a town the officers are already interested in. On that Woolish check forward, five calls, all from police officers suggesting different names, but they all have similar styles of committing fraud. On that Tesco Superstore robbery, strangely a caller who didn't actually see the programme, but heard this voice from the TV in the next room and is convinced it's not who it is. Go Uncle Soul Road, Tesco. All the staff are tied up in the cigarette room upstairs. The side door, fire exit door is open. Three other callers also think they know who it is, but they can't all be right because they've all given different names. If you know who it is, there's still a £10,000 reward. And then finally, that school burglary in Dulwich. Two callers have given the same name for one, and the police officers called with the name and address of the other. We've had a steady, if not dramatic, response to the appeal on Janet Murgatroy from Preston. She was waylaid as she walked home through town one Saturday night in June. She was dragged to a riverbank, and she was so badly injured, she drowned. And the next day, the tide came in. Graham Gooch, as I say, not dramatic, but steady. Yes, it's been a steady response. We've had more than 50 calls already. A number of names have been suggested, but we still want to hear from more people. I'm not totally convinced we've got the right name yet, so we still want to hear from anybody who recognises either the young man on Fishergate Hill, that's the young man in the white shirt and the, and the black trousers who we saw before. He's the one on the right in that picture there. Yes, that's, that's the fellow. And also the man in Strand Road who we saw earlier. We still want more suggestions as to whom, who he is. This is Saturday, June the 15th. It's about one o'clock in the morning. That was the day of the Manchester bomb, the start of the fishing season, um, a long time ago, but difficult for people to remember. There's also a couple seen arguing outside the Volvo garage, uh, just near the start of uh, Penwortham Bridge. Have they come forward? No, they haven't yet. And this is the couple, if you remember, the woman was taller than the man with whom she was arguing. They haven't come forward. We need to hear from them. And any further suggest uh, sightings of the man, who would say he's either a white man or a pale Asian man. Five foot ten to six inches, black hair. Mr Gooch, thank you very much. Jill. And that's it for tonight. You'll see a list of phone numbers shortly. Do call detectives there. If you have anything to add, do please. And if you know something on any crime we haven't covered, then call Crime Stoppers. That's a free phone number, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. We'll be back a month from now. Remember, we're on Tuesdays from now on. And the next one is on Tuesday, October the 1st. In the meantime, watch out in two weeks' time for Crime Watch File. Now, that's an update on how a major inquiry was solved by you, the Crime Watch viewers. That's on Tuesday the 17th. As Jill says, don't forget, we're back live on Tuesday, October the 1st. Do please join us then. <clears throat> Meantime, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>